insane gun upgrades. Throughout the history of warfare, it's been normal practice for the designers of weapons to find themselves tested and refined under the stress of combat. In many cases, soldiers often need more protection or firepower than their weapons originally provided. In other circumstances, real-life combat reveals flaws in their design, which were not originally picked up in factories or even with the field testing. Whatever the reason, upgrades are required for the weapon to maintain its optimal performance. Some are merely improvisations made in the field. Others are more elaborate ideas drawn up in the engineering workshops. These are some of the most unusual upgrades added to some standard weapon designs. Number 1. The Pritchard Greener Revolver Bayonet At first glance, this upgrade might appear awkward and unwieldy. When bayonets first appeared, they were intended to be accessories for muskets and then rifles, but unlike a rifle attachment, pistol bayonets were not so common on the battlefield. They weren't a new concept and had been a popular attachment, particularly used by British seamen in the late 18th century on their firearms, which were referred to as boarding pistols and were used while attacking and boarding an enemy ship. The bayonet was used as an alternative weapon once the pistol was discharged, as a ship's officer or sailor firing the pistol had no time to reload it in the heat of battle. He would use his bayonet to attack in close-quarter hand-to-hand combat. With this idea in mind, Arthur Pritchard began designing a bayonet for the Webley Mark VI service revolver. Pritchard was a retired British officer who re-enlisted in the Army when World War I started. After a year in France, he returned to England to serve as a training officer. During his service on the Western Front, he had become familiar with the trench raid tactics used by both sides. When clearing an enemy trench, soldiers were required to fix bayonets to their rifle and prepare to fight the enemy head-on, face-to-face. Officers, however, were only armed with a revolver in these attacks, which had no means of attaching a bayonet. The Webley revolver was designed to reload quickly, but Pritchard maintained that a bayonet was a far more suitable solution for reacting quickly to a situation. He presented his concept to the Wilkinson Sword Company, who produced sabers and bayonets for the British Army, but the manufacturer was already inundated with war production and had to turn down Pritchard's proposal. Wilkinson's rivals, W. W. Greener, however, saw potential and believed it could be a great commercial success. The company also had access to a surplus supply of old French Model 1874 Gras rifle bayonets, which would be converted into pistol bayonets relatively easily and cost-effectively. The top 10.5 inches of the Gras bayonet was cut off and was then fixed to a gunmetal hilt shaped to fit the Webley's frame. The bayonet's clever design meant it connected perfectly to the revolver. However, its one-pound weight would have meant that the balance of the revolver was compromised. Ultimately, W. W. Greener only produced 200 copies, and Pritchard's bayonet never officially entered service, even though officers were allowed to purchase it privately for their own personal use. Despite its negligible use in combat, the design was nonetheless both radical and impressive. Number 2. The M1911 Pistol with an Extended Magazine and Brass Catching Cage even though most weapon upgrades were designed to improve its performance, this was not always the case. Some upgrades were installed to weapons as safety measures. The World War I era airborne M1911 pistol had both its performance and safety upgrades addressed. When aircraft entered into military service, they were primarily used in reconnaissance roles. In the early days, when pilots encountered an enemy aircraft, they would salute one another in a gentlemanly manner. However, this soon changed when pilots began to engage in deadly aerial combat. Initially, airplanes were not fitted with machine guns, and so pilots had to use their standard-issue pistols. For some British Royal Flying Corps pilots, the M1911 was the weapon of choice. As there is very little time to reload a sidearm during aerial combat, an extended magazine was designed. Similar contraptions were used in land warfare, and there were examples of these magazines adapted for the pistol that carried more than 20 rounds. Unfortunately, the exact capacity of the airborne M1911 extended magazine remains unknown. The major risk with using any pistol in the relatively fragile aircraft of the time was that the ejected cases from the firearm would fly off at great speed and could lead to damage to the fuselage or mechanical parts. Especially vulnerable were planes with rear-mounted engines, because the ejected cartridges could easily end up in a critical part of its mechanism. 
In response to these hazards, a brass catching cage was mounted on the M1911 pistol alongside the extended magazine. The cage was mounted on the right side of the pistol receiver and allowed for the containment of over 20 empty cases. The cage was also carefully designed so as not to interfere with how the pilot held the weapon. Upon firing, the receiver would retract and the empty case would drop directly into the cage. Even though extended magazines were commonly used with World War I pistols, there are few records of cartridge catching cages being made in any significant quantity. Number 3. The Mule Adaptive Storage Stock Extended and adaptive stocks were commonplace amongst many weapon upgrades. In many cases, weapons had inbuilt storage areas within their stock. These were usually for weapon cleaning kits or oil containers that a soldier may require in the field for quick maintenance of his gun. In 2015, however, the American company Mule Tactical raised the adaptive stock design to a new level. They designed a buttstock which had an internal compartment for a backup pistol. The Modular Utility Linked Equipment, or Mule for short, adaptive storage stock was initially built for the AR-15 and M4 family of assault rifles but also created versions for shotguns as well. Made of a high-impact polymer, the stock is slightly curved at the butt and is capped with a firm rubber pad. With the press of a button, the lower part pivots on a hinge and reveals a holster for a pistol. The holster is interchangeable so that various different types of pistols can be stored, including compact pistols. While the design is well-engineered and unique, its usefulness has been questioned. The purpose is, of course, to provide a secondary firearm for the shooter. But in reality, swapping to a dedicated weapon from a normal holster is much quicker in a tactical situation. Number 4. The Peterson Device Periscope fittings for the M1903 Springfield rifle were not the only thing the Americans experimented with during World War I. The more important issue with the rifle was its slow reloading cycle, which was as a result of its very powerful 30-06 round. The American engineer John D. Peterson sought to address this by offering an unusual solution. He designed a special bolt that fitted the standard M1903 receiver and allowed the rifle to be fired as a semi-automatic. Peterson's automatic bolt also had a special magazine, which could hold 40 rounds of the 30 caliber pistol cartridges. These were the same caliber as the standard Springfield rounds, but because they were shorter, they had significantly less power, a compromise that allowed the rifle to fire as a semi-automatic. This reduced the rifle's effective range from 500 down to 300 yards. The Peterson device had a built-in grooved barrel that fitted the longer chamber of the M1903 rifle. The magazine was also unusually mounted at a 45-degree angle to allow unhindered use of the rifle sights. The device was cleverly designed so that it could also be used alongside the classic rifle bolt. This meant, however, that modifications had to be made, which included a small ejection port for spent cartridges and the adjacent stock cut. When the user wished to alternate to semi-automatic fire, he would have to empty his magazine, take out the standard bolt, and replace it with the Peterson device. This clever piece of technology was viewed by the American military as a groundbreaking wonder weapon. They were sure its high rate of fire was sure to suppress even the heaviest fortified German line. They imagined a line of soldiers advancing across no man's land firing this device at the enemy trenches. As they ran, it would be extremely difficult for anyone in the trenches to show his head or any part of his body. In reality, production of the rifle simply started too late in the war, beginning in late 1918. When the government canceled the contract, 65,000 devices with 1.6 million magazines, 65 million cartridges, and over 101,000 modified Springfield rifles had been manufactured. They were quickly declared surplus, however, and were soon obsolete once the M1 Garand semi-automatic rifle was introduced into service. Although these upgrades and modifications all operated in unique ways, whether it be in purpose, appearance, or an operating principle, they all had one common purpose. That was to improve a weapon system and to enhance the shooter's chances of survival. The Best Magazine Locations of World War II During the Second World War, millions of men clashed in a titanic struggle upon which the fate of the world rested. Even before war broke out, Nations poured considerable resources into weapons development in an attempt to give their soldiers an advantage in the coming conflict. Firearm designs were given significant attention. Of particular interest was the ammunition feeding mechanism of the firearms that would be issued to their troops. In the conflict, 
The majority of soldiers were equipped with bolt-action rifles, which generally fed from internal magazines. Likewise, the semi-automatic M1 Garand issued to American GIs had a similar system, using clips that were held internally. A myriad of machine guns were fed using belts of ammunition, such as the legendary German MG42, the American M1919 30 caliber Browning, or on strips like the Japanese Type 92 heavy machine gun. While these types of firearms were highly successful, there was a need for more portable firepower, and an increasing number of troops were equipped with automatic and semi-automatic guns, many of which were fed from detachable box magazines. Continually experimenting for optimal performance, the location of these magazines could vary greatly from underneath the weapon, from the top of the gun, or jutting out from the side. Each had its own advantages and disadvantages which were tested out in the field of combat. Easily the most common location for a detachable magazine was the underside of the weapon. Firearms that used this design were numerous and included the German MP40, the American Browning automatic rifle and Thompson submachine gun, the Soviet PPSH-41, and many, many others. Ergonomically, this was the most efficient when the user was standing, kneeling, or moving. A magazine could be changed while still maintaining a sight picture on an enemy. Furthermore, the magazine is out of the way of the sight, which is most ideally located along the top of the firearm, leaving a clear sight picture. Reloading is also aided by gravity. Once the magazine release is pressed, the empty magazine could simply fall out, ready for a replacement, though the soldier would have to remember to pick it up for reuse later. This also means that the weapon is well balanced, with an inline center of gravity, further aiding accurate shooting. While most firearms are made with right-handed shooters in mind, as empty shell casings are ejected from the right side of the weapon, it can be used by a left-handed shooter more efficiently than a side-mounted magazine. Displacement does have drawbacks, however. In order to feed properly, the new rounds are fighting against gravity, and as such, the springs and feed mechanisms must be strong enough to overcome this force, though with proper manufacturing, this is a relatively minor issue. The larger problem is found while firing prone. From this position, a long magazine may rest on the ground. In a worst-case scenario, this could create pressure on the magazine, bending it out of shape and causing jams. The magazine may also drag on the ground, balancing awkwardly, throwing off the user's aim. This can be remedied by holding the weapon higher off the surface, but this exposes the user to return fire. Some weapons, like the Browning automatic rifle, overcame this issue by sacrificing ammunition capacity, carrying a mere 20 rounds, not the most efficient for protracted firefights. Finally, underside magazine placement may encourage users to grip the magazine while firing, a particular issue with shorter weapons like submachine guns, a problem exacerbated by the very far forward placement of the magazine, such as on the German MP40. This creates unstable handling of the weapon compared to using the front grip, which is usually further down the length of the weapon, hampering stability. Depending on the quality of the manufacturing, grabbing the magazine may also lead to jams and other feeding issues, if the magazines are poorly made. In some cases, this may even cause the user to inadvertently pull the magazine from the gun while it is firing, though this is exceedingly rare and can be mitigated by proper manufacturing methods. This issue can also be overcome with proper training to prevent soldiers from handling their weapon in such a way. In spite of these limitations, underside-mounted ammunition magazines are far and away the most common location, something which persists to this day in the overwhelming majority of magazine-fed firearms. Another idea that was implemented was the complete opposite, placing the magazine on top of the weapon. Machine guns such as the British Bren gun, the Australian Owen gun, and the Japanese Type 96 all use this type of feed location. The first advantage of a top-mounted magazine is when used in the prone position. This allows the user to lie completely on the ground and fire effectively while the magazine is conveniently out of the way. With the magazine clear of the ground, the amount of ammunition is less restrictive, which means that more firepower can be brought to bear. Changing the magazine from a prone position is much easier than from underneath. The weapon can remain in the same position instead of being twisted sideways while being reloaded. With the ammunition following gravity rather than fighting against it, feeding the weapon as it fires is much easier. One issue faced by users of the Bren gun was a reported lack of concealment, as the large magazine added to the silhouette of the weapon. In spite of the success of many of the weapons that use this setup, there are numerous issues. With the magazine jutting from the top of the gun, the sight picture is hampered, forcing the use of side-mounted sights, which are awkward to use. Furthermore, the advantages in reloading only translate when firing from a prone position. When kneeling, standing, or moving, reloading is much more difficult and inefficient compared to those guns with undermounted magazines. 
This was a serious liability on the modern battlefield where mobility is of paramount importance. After the war, the top-mounted magazine design was largely abandoned. It does still exist today, however, in the form of the Belgian-made FNP-90 series. One of the more unusual locations for magazine placement is at the side. This is a very rare configuration, being found in some early examples of German submachine guns such as the MP-18 and MP-28. During the Second World War, the most famous example of a side-mounted magazine was the British Sten gun, but could also be found on the American Johnson M1914 light machine gun and the German FG-42, both of which saw a limited service. The main advantage of a side-mounted magazine is its convenience when firing from a prone position. The magazine is clear of the ground, while the top of the weapon is unobstructed, leaving a clear sight picture. When used as a light machine gun in tandem with an assistant gunner, the weapon can be reloaded quickly and easily while not having to shift the weapon or expose themselves to the enemy. Since it is clear from the ground, ammunition capacity is not limited, and magazines can be of a larger size than their undermounted counterparts. This, however, is where the advantages end. One of the most glaring issues with a side-mounted magazine is the width of the weapon. Instead of a streamlined gun, the weapon now has a large piece of hardware sticking out at an odd angle, something that can easily be caught on narrow openings, limiting utility in tight spaces, a liability in urban environments, which became more and more commonplace locations for combat. The weapon is also awkward, as the weight of the magazine shifts the center of gravity away from the center line of the weapon. This requires the shooter to constantly compensate, an unnecessary distraction in combat. With the side-mounted magazine, there's also no chance that the weapon can be used ambidextrously. While most other firearms are configured for right-handed shooters, lefties can operate them effectively, if a bit awkwardly. These challenges are magnified when using an asymmetrical firearm, making it all but unusable. Due to the challenges of side-mounted magazines, the concept has largely been abandoned in modern times, being used only in the M249 saw. Though normally belt-fed, it does have a magazine well which accepts NATO standard magazines should the situation require it. After being tested in the fires of the most destructive conflict in world history, it is clear that in spite of its limitations, undermounted magazines are much more effective than its top or side-mounted counterparts. While each has its own benefits, these are outweighed by their drawbacks, and for the most part, have largely been left behind. Special Forces Loadouts for soldiers to operate at their full potential, they need the right equipment. For special forces, the unique nature of their missions makes the careful selection of weapons and other equipment an even more pertinent concern. These units have access to a wide variety of gear that's not always available to other soldiers. Ukrainian Special Forces The Sig Sauer MCX After the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, Ukraine received massive amounts of support from the global community. Among these aid packages were large amounts of weaponry, including some of the latest in military tech. Pictorial evidence has shown Ukrainian Special Forces operators wielding the new Sig Sauer MCX. First introduced to the public in 2015, this rifle is a versatile platform for a multitude of roles. The operating system is a short-stroke, gas-operated piston with a rotating bolt. Though similar to the M4, it does not require a buffer tube, allowing for the addition of side-folding stocks. The MCX features a system that allows for conversion between 556 by 45 mm NATO, 300 AAC blackout, and 762 by 39 mm ammunition. Using standard 5.56mm Stanag magazines for 5.56x45mm NATO and 300 AAC blackout, and specifically designed Stanag compatible magazines for 7.62x39mm. It also has varying barrel lengths from a short 9-inch variant, seen in use by many Ukrainian operators, which is useful in close quarters, a standard 11.5-inch barrel, and a 16-inch barrel. The weapon can also use a suppressor, dramatically reducing muzzle flash and noise of firing. No matter how it's set up, the weapon is lightweight, weighing in at under 9 pounds, though this can vary based on the exact configuration. Using standard 556 by 45 mm ammunition, it has a range of 503 meters and a cyclic rate of fire of around 800 to 900 rounds per minute fed from NATO standard 30-round detachable Stanag box magazines.
It needs a specially designed Stanag compatible magazine, however, to house the 7.62mm ammo. In addition to the built-in features, the MCX can also come equipped with a Picatinny rail system, allowing the easy addition of various optics, light systems, and other attachments, which can be easily swapped out as situations dictate. Though new, the Sig Sauer MCX has already proven itself a versatile and invaluable part of Ukraine's arsenal, as it defends itself from Russian forces. H and K416 Delta Force the term Delta Force is synonymous worldwide with excellence in special operations, and as a result, has a need for special equipment for a variety of missions. Partnering with German firearm manufacturer Heckler & Koch, creators of the legendary MP5 series of submachine guns, Delta oversaw the creation of the HK416. The weapon bears many similarities to the standard issue M4, being a gas-operated rotating bolt system. There are differences, however, as the HK416 utilizes a short-stroke gas piston system, similar to the G36, also manufactured by H&K. This makes the HK416 more reliable than the M4, particularly when immersed in water or in other less-than-ideal conditions. The rifle is chambered for a NATO standard 556 by 45 mm and is fed from a 10, 20, or 30-round Stanag magazine. It's also compatible with the 100-round Twin Drum Beta C Mag. It comes in various barrel lengths, 10.4 inches, 14.5 inches, 16.4 inches, or 20 inches, which can be swapped out quickly as required. It has a cyclic rate of fire between 700 and 900 rounds per minute at an effective range of 400 meters. In addition to acting as a rifle, the HK416 can also come with an underslung 40mm grenade launcher. The exact weight can vary based on the configuration, but it weighs in at approximately 7 pounds. It also comes equipped with a Picatinny rail system which allows it to quickly change various optics, scopes, and other attachments as needed. A suppressor can also be attached, which reduces the sound and muzzle flash of the weapon in use. Since its introduction, the HK416 has become very popular, not only among Delta Force for whom it was made, but also many other units such as the Navy SEALs, NASA's Emergency Response Team, the FBI Hostage Rescue Team, and many international units, including the Polish GROP, the German Special Forces Command, French Special Forces Command, and many others. This weapon also gained notoriety as it was used during Operation Neptune Spear, the action which hunted down Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden. L-119A1-A2 British SAS When the SAS was in need of a replacement for the C-7 and M-16 rifles in use, they were not too keen on using the British military standard L-85 variant of the SA-80 rifle. For a new weapon, they turned to Canadian manufacturer Dymaco. Though based on the existing C7 platform, the resulting rifle made many changes, being designated the L119A1. There are two versions of the L119A1, the SFIW, or Special Forces Individual Weapon, which has a barrel length of 15.7 inches, and the L119A1 CQB carbine which has a shortened 10-inch barrel. The SFIW is the standard weapon for the SAS and other British Special Forces, while the CQB carbine is utilized primarily for room clearing and VIP protection duties, replacing the MP5 for this role. Both variants fire the standard NATO 556 by 45 mm cartridges from 30-round Stanag box magazines. The action is a gas-operated rotating bolt and has a cyclic rate of fire of 700 to 900 rounds. They have a flat-top upper receiver, which allows it to mount various types of scopes or just simple iron sights. A separate rail system is located on the handguard, allowing the mounting of flashlights and other accessories. The weapon can also be fitted with a suppressor. Around 2013, British Special Forces began looking for a replacement for the L-19A1, which led to the development of the L-19A2, manufactured by Colt Canada, 
formerly Dymaco. While maintaining the same basic design as its predecessor, there were significant changes. The main difference is the addition of an LMT monolithic receiver. This allowed for the more straightforward fitting of scopes, sights, light sources, and other attachments than the previous version. It also had an upgraded trigger system, which made firing the weapon a lot easier. There were some drawbacks, though, as the new weapon was more difficult to clean and can overheat more quickly. The L-119A has been in service for less than a decade, meaning there is limited information on its combat performance. It did gain some attention in 2019 as the weapon wielded by Obi-Wan Nairobi, or SAS operator Chris Craighead, during the Nairobi Westlands mall attack. KBP-9A-91 – Russian Spetsnaz After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian government had a need for a new weapon system that would be specifically used for close-quarter fighting. Turning away from the venerable AK class of weapons that were and still are the mainstay of post-Soviet militaries. Developed in 1993 by the KBP Instrument Design Bureau, the 9A91 utilized a long-stroke gas piston with a rotating bolt. The pistol grip and handguard are made from lightweight polymers, though the bulk of the weapon is manufactured from stamped steel components. Optics or other accessories can be mounted on the top of the receiver, and all but the earliest models can utilize a suppressor. The primary concern during the creation of the 9A91 was its size for close-quarter combat, and as such it comes with a foldable stock. The full length of the weapon with extended stock is just over 23 inches, and about 14 inches with the stock folded. The 9A91 is classified as a submachine gun, and it fires specialized 9mm by 39 subsonic cartridges, which are claimed to be able to penetrate even the latest body armor, and fed from a straight, 20-round box magazine, a break from the curved magazines used by conventional Soviet assault weapon designs. Because of the low muzzle velocity of the subsonic ammunition, the range is limited, around 200 meters though the effective range is around half that at 100 meters. The 9A91 can fire both semi or fully automatic with a cyclic rate of fire between 700 and 900 rounds per minute. A sub-variant of the 9A91 is a sniper rifle, known as the VSK-94. It is very similar in design except for the folding stock, which was replaced by a fixed skeleton buttstock and an integrated suppressor to limit the sound the weapon makes when firing. Though it does have the same limited range of its predecessor, the VSK-94 is still ideal for precision shooting at close ranges, ideal for police work and VIP protection. Both weapons have found service with the Russian Spetsnaz as well as Russian law enforcement, and have been exported to friendly states that maintain close ties to Russia, including Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, Syria, and others. Corner Shot – Israeli Mossad and Special Forces Sometimes, it's not the actual tool, but the way in which it's used that's most important for securing success on the battlefield. Designed in the early 2000s by Lt. Col. Amos Golan of the Israeli Defense Forces, Corner Shot is not a weapon, but an accessory that can keep a soldier safe while engaging targets. The unit is a chassis that weighs in at 8.5 pounds and 33 inches in length, about the same as a typical carbine. To this, a semi-automatic pistol can be mounted at the front. This is then bore-sighted, and the weapon is aimed using a small 2.5-inch color LCD camera display on the side of the weapon. The main feature is the hinging lever, which can traverse the muzzle of the system up to 62 degrees. This allows the user to remain safely behind cover while monitoring the battlefield. A trigger extension linkage allows the weapon to be fired, also while the operator is hidden from view and safe. Corner shot is compatible with most semi-automatic pistols in military service including the Glock 17, 18, and 19, the Sig Sauer P226, 
the Beretta 92F, and many others. Other variants of the weapon can mount a 5.56mm rifle, such as an AR-15 series, minus the buttstock. Another version has an integrated 40mm single-shot grenade launcher for breaching doors. No matter where they're deployed, soldiers need the best tools possible to perform their jobs effectively. Because of their missions, special forces have some of the most advanced and unique weapons and tools available, enabling them to excel at performing their duty. Shooting Positions One of the easiest ways to tell the difference between amateur and professional sharpshooters is how they choose to handle their weapons. Different gun stances will reveal the comfort and experience someone has when handling a gun. A professional soldier will hold a weapon with confidence that they know how to operate and maintain it for the best results. At the same time, someone with little experience or informal training will have an underlying stress level when holding a gun. As with any foreign subject, gun operation is a learned skill and one that comes after years of experience. This is because it's not just the way someone handles a gun that's indicative of their experience level, but the way they react when something goes wrong with their weapon. Knowing how to quickly clear a jam or fix the sights on a weapon while under attack can only come with training and exposure to hostile environments. While it is easy to sit in the comfort of home and take a gun apart piece by piece to examine it thoroughly for defects, being able to perform this same task while being shot at is a skill few possess. Likewise, it's easy to work on weapon grip and correct breathing techniques at the gun range, but remembering how to properly handle a weapon safely while in combat can mean life or death. Five of the most common gun positions for soldiers, hunters, and anyone looking to improve their shot are prone position, the weaver stance, the powerpoint stance, the Harry's technique, and a stance from the Soviet Manual of Arms. Some positions, such as the prone position, can be used for both handguns and rifles, but other stances, such as the weaver stance and Harry's technique, are used exclusively for handguns. There are both positive and negative elements to each stance. However, all five stances are renowned for their ability to allow marksmen fast, accurate target acquisition. Here's a closer look at each of them. The prone position. This means that the shooter should be lying flat and their head facing downward. This position is mostly associated with snipers and other gunmen who must remain hidden while shooting. Prone positions are utilized for their long-range capability and offer the shooter the most stable shot. However, they're not often used in the field due to natural obstacles that can inhibit the eyesight of the marksmen, such as dense vegetation and tree branches. The key element to a successful prone position is good bone contact with the gun. Shooters don't want to use their muscles to stabilize the barrel. They want the leverage of a large bone such as the non-dominant forearm or a cheekbone to rest the sight on. For right-handed shooters, this position should be centered around the left elbow. Some simple steps to get into a prone position are first getting down on the stomach, planting both elbows in the dirt for support, putting the gun stock in the cheek well, and then shifting their body weight for stability. The body should be positioned at an angle to the target or straight back, depending on the shooter's comfort. Alternatively, the shooter can use a backpack, folded clothing, or hand to prop up the weapon, and certain specialist guns have the facility to use a bipod for support. The left elbow should be used as a fixed brace in this position. While offering stability for long-range shots, prone positions need to be more reliable in many situations because of the unpredictable environment and visual obstacles. The Weaver Stance Developed in the 1950s by Los Angeles Deputy Sheriff Jack Weaver, this shooting method is one of the most popular two-hand stances used in combat-style matches. It was first developed to compete in leather slap matches, which were competitions in which individuals competed to draw and fire a shot at combat distance while being timed with a stopwatch. It's an aggressive boxer-type stance that requires the support side foot to be placed forward 8 to 10 inches and the strong side toes to be canted 45 degrees outward. The gun is presented to the target with both hands, with the strong side arm slightly bent and the support arm at a 45 degree angle. This technique creates a firm grip on the gun and allows a fast sight picture. The weaver stance offers advantages over other two-hand stances, such as a wider swing arc to support the side, making it easy to pivot quickly to the left or right, and fast sight acquisition at even longer ranges. 
As with any stance, however, it has its drawbacks, one being that shooters with cross-dominant vision will struggle to fire accurately. In addition, the stance requires an increased upper body strength to absorb recoil. The Weaver stance was nonetheless revolutionary and heavily studied by small arms enthusiasts, including Ray Chapman, a world-renowned sports shooter and firearms instructor. Chapman modified the Weaver stance to address the issues he saw and made it even more effective for shooters of all abilities. So if you're looking for a fast and powerful two-hand stance, the Weaver stance is the way to go. The PowerPoint stance. This is a valuable technique for those who need to quickly and accurately fire a handgun with either their strong or weak hand. This stance is one of the few gun-holding positions that utilize a one-handed grip, and it requires the gun side foot to drive forward 15 to 20 inches, with the shoulder pushing into the gun and the knees flexed, mimicking the motion of a boxer throwing a hard punch. The non-shooting hand is tucked tightly into the center of the chest, with the palm facing upward and the fist clenched to solidify the upper shoulder muscles and promote better trigger control. Proper technique is crucial with the PowerPoint stance, and it takes a significant amount of practice to hit a target with only one hand accurately. However, this stance is applicable in many scenarios, such as if the non-shooting hand is occupied or injured. The aggressive punch-to-the-target motion will still provide the accuracy and speed necessary for close-range shooting. It's worth noting that most two-handed stances are preferable to only using one hand to aim a handgun. However, the PowerPoint stance is the most accurate and reliable position that gives shooters an alternative in the event of an emergency. The Harry's Technique This technique is employed while working in dark spaces and utilizes a flashlight and handgun to provide light and protection. Most often associated with police and FBI personnel, this stance allows the shooter to move through buildings at night without sacrificing vision or accuracy. To use the Harry's technique, the shooter must hold the flashlight in their weak hand and then cross this hand under their gun hand. Next, pressing the back of the weak hand against the back of the strong hand will create isometric tension and stability to both the flashlight and the handgun. However, it is hard to push the strong hand against the weak hand and for many will cause fatigue after a short duration. This iconic technique is more stable than the FBI or neck index techniques, making it easier to index the light and the sights in the same place. Countless movies have shown this technique in action, and many brave officers have utilized it as they made their way into a dark building. It's a valuable technique to learn that takes advantage of the off-hand's hold on a flashlight to provide accurate shots in the dark. Soviet Manual of Arms during times of war, instructional magazines and manuals were issued to soldiers detailing how to best operate and maintain weapons and equipment. When the AK-47 rifle was introduced during the Cold War, a manual was also printed and detailed the best gun holding position to use while firing the weapon. What later became known as a Soviet-style grip is best characterized by the bowing out of the dominant hand and high placement of the gun stock next to the cheek. The non-dominant hand was placed comfortably under the rifle's forend or lower handguard and offered aim support. While this technique was easily learned and offered some control and accuracy over the weapon, one of the many problems with the stance was its inability to counter the tendency of the rifle to rise while shooting. The recoil of the AK-47 caused the gun to start lifting over its original placement and fire bullets over the target. Later, the Soviet-style technique would be transformed and improved to give the Red Army mastery over their weapons. These five gun stances, the prone position, weaver stance, powerpoint stance, Harry's technique, and Soviet manual of arms are all iconic and influential shooting methods that marksmen have used for years. Professional soldiers and experienced hunters alike have mastered these stances and used them to accurately and quickly fire off shots even in the most hostile environments. Although there's no way to guarantee that stress will not intervene and aggravate someone's ability to perform these stances, knowing how to get into them can save their life. The positions vary in their effectiveness and suitability for different weapons. However, all four have proven to be reliable and effective in their own right. It's clear that mastering the basics of any of these stances can turn an amateur marksman into a professional with enough practice and dedication. Ultimately, the key to becoming an effective marksman is to understand the basics of gun safety and operation, and develop the confidence and skill to operate a gun in any situation. 
So if you want to prepare for a self-defense situation or better understand how contemporary gun stances evolved, starting with these five is the best way to learn about different gun holding positions.